the history of Haiti first. Um, it's going to be short, but I wanted to get into this and then we will talk about we'll talk about um, what's going on now. So Let me go to Yeah. So this is a speech. This is a speech by Claire Daly. And of course, Claire Daly is based because she comes with the facts. And so some of you have already heard this before, but this is just a quick rundown, and then we will continue into what's going on. Haiti is the site of the first and only successful slave revolution in history. Haitians won their independence from France in 1804 and immediately abolished slavery, becoming the first place in the world to do so. It was also the first state to outlaw racism in its constitution. Haiti was a beacon of light for the world and it was punished for it. It was punished over and over again by France, by the US, through a series of coups invasions, occupations, assassinations, through relentless meddling and crushing debt. They were determined that this beacon of freedom would be extinguished because it presented a bold challenge to the dread logic of capital and empire. But the Haitian people kept fighting through. Theirs is a light that never goes out. And so it's still being punished. The meddling goes on. If Haiti is a mess, and it is, then Europe and the EU are to, and the US are to blame. If we want to support the Haitian people, and we should, we'll stand up to the US, the world's bully, tell them to get out of Haiti and get out of it ourselves. So that is the history of Haiti. Um, and so there's a lot going on there. Um, and let me share this article with you guys really quick first. Um, shout out to, I like to call her Auntie Margaret, because Margaret Kimberly came out with an article about Haiti recently. If you guys have not subscribed and get your news from Black Agenda Report. You guys are missing out, so make sure to do that. But this says, Kagame and other stooges do U.S. bidding in Haiti. Excuse me. One second. So it starts off, it says, it can be argued that Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame, is the black head of state most useful to the U.S. and its allies. There are many human tools in their box, but Kagame, is the most willing to act on behalf of the collective West. He can re reliably be called upon to enthusiastically do the dirty work of the U.S. and Europe. When he arrived at the recent CARICOM summit, it was clear that a terrible plot was being hatched. When the United Kingdom wanted to stop the flow of asylum seekers, they hatched a plot with Kagame, giving him $180 million to take them to Rwanda against their will. UK courts have blocked the plan thus far, but it's an example of how he always makes himself of service. The UK is not alone in paying him off. Denmark has also been in talks with Kagame to take refugees too. First of all, one thing I want to say is when people talk about, oh my God, we just need a socially democratic country so that we can have things better. Socially democratic countries will take the gains that they have, and they will pass off the losses to developing countries, to third world countries. 
So what they do is that they will use these underdeveloped countries to essentially exploit them in order to have the gains that they have. And then when people from these overly exploited countries decide, hey, I'm going to go to the country that is making money and making gains off of us, then they go, eh, nope, 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 nope. You can't come in. You can't come in. Nope. So when black people want to go to places like Denmark, Denmark's like, stop. Nope, you can't come in. When people from places like Burkina Faso or Congo or places like Uganda or Rwanda or, or Burundi or people from South Africa, when they want to go to a European country, European countries are like, eh, can't come in. Even though places like France, they're like, nah, you guys can't come in from Kenya. Nah, you guys can't come in from these other countries. We don't want you here even though you got all your resources and all your wealth from these same countries. You don't, you don't want them in even though you exploited them. This is the same thing with the United States because the United States does it because we will exploit countries like Nicaragua, Honduras, Chile, Bolivia. We will exploit them. And the moment they want to cross into the border, we like, you can't come in. Even though they were exploited and they were stolen from. Let's continue. As in 2014, Rwanda concluded a secret agreement with Israel to take its African refugees. Hmm, something's funny about that. For some reason, Israel doesn't want black refugees. Are you surprised? I sure am. Why wouldn't they want black people in their country? Hmm, even the black Jews that come in from Africa, they don't want them either. Why? Maybe, just maybe, because the state of Israel, like the United States, is racist. Maybe, just maybe. Interesting. You want to know how? Look at the way they treat Palestinians. Look at the way they treat black people. Look at the way they treat the indigenous. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's true. Girl, you know it's true. All right, let's continue. So I'm not gonna read the entire one, the entire article, but I want to go. To the end. She says, it bears repeating that Haiti is an example of black liberation, which is why it has been punished for asserting its rights for the past 200 years. Its people have been subject to invasions and puppet leadership and oligarchs who are in league with their oppressors. No one should be fooled by corporate media who work hand in glove with the U.S. to promote their narratives. They know that the gang narrative, the gang narrative is used in eliciting support for the latest act of aggression. So instead of terrorists, they're now saying gangs. They will give the impression that when thousands of Haitians protest for higher wages or make their demands that they are just an unruly gang mob, they don't reveal that Haiti has no elected leadership and that the prime minister, Ariel Henry, was chosen by the core group or that the United Nations plays a large role in Haiti's subjugation. Likewise, know that the presence of a one in president at the Caribbean summit is proof that an African face is needed to make the case for wrongdoing. The upcoming intervention will be called Humanitarian Corridor, but it will be business as usual 
in the ongoing project to subjugate Haiti. So this article is really good. Give it some traffic. Auntie Margaret lays it out very well in here. So there is the link to the article as well. Put it in the Rockfin side too. Okay, so now that we got that, one of the things I want to bring out, oh, let me go here. So now we know the history of Haiti, it's a very short Cliff Notes version, right? Let's go to how they have been subject to abuse by the United States. Make sure. Take that down. Okay. Flashlight. Dead. Okay. So this has been going on for quite a while. This is entitled Bill Clinton's trade policies destroyed Haitian rice farming. Now Haiti faces a uh, post hurricane post hurricane famine. This was back in 2016, y'all. Let's go. After the earthquake, and still many people live in makeshift tents because of the earthquake from 2010. But being there in Port-au-Prince and seeing ceremonies with President Bill Clinton, who said and there are two critical issues in his life at that time. One was the marriage of his daughter, the imminent marriage of Chelsea, and the other is the reconstruction of Haiti. He was a major force in Haiti. What happened? So first of all, we have to go back when we look at Bill Clinton and his relationship in Haiti when he was president. One of the worst things that he's done that's still hurting Haiti now, especially in the wake of these disasters that keep happening to Haiti, is this policy where he took the excess rice from Arkansas, where he's from, and dumped it in Haiti and used our tax dollars to subsidize it. Up until this past recent year, there's legislation that keeps getting knocked off to reverse this policy, although he apologized for it. Let's go to that apology. Yeah. Yes, in 2010, former President Clinton publicly apologized for forcing Haiti to drop tariffs on imported subsidized U.S. rice. During his time in office, the policy wiped out Haitian rice farming, seriously damaging Haiti's ability to be self-sufficient. This is... So, first of all, basically making... Haiti paid for rice instead of them building their own, planting and cultivating their own. That's basically the equivalent of me having a farm and instead of me being able to farm and grow my own food, you're forcing me to go to the grocery store to get the food that I could have grown myself. Mm -mm -mm. The president apologizing at a hearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at the time. He was the U.N. special envoy to Haiti. Since 1981, the United States has followed a policy until the last year or so. We started rethinking it. That we rich countries that produce a lot of food should sell it to poor countries and relieve them of the burden of producing their own food. So thank goodness they can leap directly into the industrial era. It has not worked. It's maybe been good for some of my farmers in Arkansas, but it has not worked. It was a mistake. It was a mistake that I was a party to. I am not pointing the finger at anybody. I did that. I have to live every day with the consequences of the lost capacity to produce a rice crop in Haiti to feed those people. It wasn't a mistake. Corporate profits. Your corporatism. It wasn't a mistake. 
It was a transgression that you did willingly. Anyway, good Lord. Because of what I did, nobody else. That's President Clinton. This natural. practice is still in effect, and Haiti is always getting rice dumped on them. Rice is a staple. There's no reason why Haiti should be importing rice, because that's something that's always... The, the rice grown in Haiti is much healthier. Ever since this rice has been coming in, there have been di um, diabetes epidemics. People didn't used to have that much diabetes. This is the worst thing that could have happened to Haiti. But Did you guys know that? Did y'all know that? That the rice is literally less healthy coming from the United States into Haiti? Haiti actually has... They could actually make their rice and it be healthier for them because truth a lot be told is that the rice here is more processed. You ever wonder why people in Japan eat a ton of rice and yet there are instances of diabetes and obesity isn't that high? They eat rice daily with every meal. And yet, they're like this, skinny. There's a reason for it. Right now, in the aftermath of the hurricane, with uh, Haitian officials warning there could be a famine, what are the most critical actions that you feel need to be taken? I think it has to be supporting the farmers that are in these hardest hit areas. You know, um, by bringing rice and other things that could have been grown in Haiti, that's not helping at all. I think we need to support the farmers to, to start to recrop you know, going forward and for the long term of Haiti. We need to start growing our rice in Haiti again, supporting the farmers in the Larti Bonit version, um, the Larti Bonit region of Haiti, where rice has always been grown in Haiti and supplied for the entire and country. And for the families of loved ones who have died for the typh for um, the cholera epidemic, what is most critical right now that you're hearing from family and friends there? I just think support, I mean, most families are, are supported by um, their families over here. And the fact that these refugees are being returned, these are refugees that want to work to support their families. If they're going to keep them in detention, they're not able to work. Prior to this announcement, September 22nd, they were letting them in. Four to 5,000 people came in. They simply stopped it because they thought it would look bad for Hillary Clinton with the, with the um, election coming on and having all these refugees come in. There are thousands more. They thought it would look bad for Hillary Clinton. So, Donald Trump not letting any type of refugees in, right? Or putting them in cages at the border. Joe Biden also not letting the refugees in or putting them in cages at the border. Like I said, what's the difference between them? I mean, they look so much alike when you look at their policies. More on the way. Let these people work and let them support their families. Ninaj Raul, I want to thank you for being with us. Executive Director. Yeah. And that's the crazy part. You know, a lot of times people will look at Biden and say, well, he's, you know, better than Trump. But in reality, I mean, they still kept Title 42 in place. Now, here's the link to the foundation she's with is HaitianRefugees.org. And look at here, look at this. Can, can we, can we just, can we read this thing, hang on? Wait, what does is, what is this say? It says, tell President Biden to stop the racist deportations now. It says the, Bi the Biden, ha I guess, uh, the Biden has ramped up the deportation flights to Haiti, 
directly targeting Haitian asylum seekers. Since President Biden was in office, he has managed to deport, expel over 20,000 Haitians within the first year of office and thousands more beyond. More Haitian women, men, and children have been deported to Haiti by the Biden administration than under three prior presidents, Trump, Obama, and Bush combined. Families are being separated once again and subject to cruel treatment. The Department of Homeland Security needs to redesignate temporary protective status, TPS, for Haitians to recognize the extreme conditions in Haiti, including dangerous gang violence, climate change, and layers of natural and man-made disasters. Joe Biden is literally deporting more Haitian people than Trump, Biden, I'm sorry, than Trump, Clinton, oh gosh, I'm getting all these war criminals names uh, mixed up, than Trump, Obama, and Bush combined. So that's the crazy part. A lot of people don't really know. All right. So and they're saying, oh, my God, there's these gangs, right? Like, look, let me show you guys. This is from the New Yorker. New Yorker put out this harrowing story. You know, New Yorker, they're, they're liberals. And it's entitled, Haiti Held Hostage. Gangs control the capital. Foreign help is scarce. It says, Candy and Battle Island nation save itself. And they're talking about it's held hostage. And the crazy part is you, you want to ask the question, like, why? Why is Haiti being held hostage? Right? And on top of it, you're like, wait a minute. Also, this is also happening. This is from the Hill. Haiti is experiencing a brush with famine. UN slashes food assistance. Like the calls from coming inside the call is coming from inside the house, boo. What's happening with people who are you know struggling with food, struggling with gang violence? The calls from coming inside the house. Now, why do I say that? Well, let's go. Let me show you guys this. Make sure. All right. Let me share the screen. Let's get it. Okay. Listen to this. Thousands of Haitians are standing against their government and telling the U.S. to stay out of Haiti. No Canadian, no American. You are the monster. You have no solution. So he says, "No to the Canadians. No to the Americans. You are monsters. You don't have solutions." You are chaos. You are behind the gangsterization of crime. He says, you are giving arms to our brothers and those in underprivileged neighborhoods. On October 7th, Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry called for foreign intervention to fight gang violence. However, there's more to this story than the prime minister is letting on. Haitians have been protesting for months over inflation, food prices, and water shortages. But in September, Henry announced a plan to cut fuel subsidies that doubled the price of fuel on the island, which caused protests to escalate. 
one group even began blocking deliveries from Haiti's main fuel port in protest of the plan. Clearing this blockade is one of the main reasons for requesting foreign troops enter the country. This gentleman says, when you're at the root of the problem, you gangsterize the country. Sorry. He said there have been massacres and squandering. The three powers, legislative, judicial, and executive, no longer exist. Basically, he's saying they live in a failed state. He says, as a result, you can no longer be part of the solution. He says, Desalanes, Haitian revolution leader, renounced domination. And now you're asking for them for military occupation as if it were the solution. But underdevelopment is the product of fierce capitalism. Boom. Keep them destabilized. That's basically what they're doing. That's the problem. This is no different than what's going on in places like Somalia. The United States wants to keep them destabilized so that they can do what they want to their country. This makes excuses for putting... for putting troops on the ground in places like Haiti, places like DRC, places like Somalia. This is why. This is how the United States does it. Many Haitians see Henry as an illegitimate leader and have been calling for him to resign. In Haiti, the prime minister is appointed by the president. Former president Jovenel Moise was fighting to stay in power when he appointed Henry. Days later, Moise was assassinated. Assassinated. Hmm. By who? Since then, Henry, with the backing of the U.S. and other foreign powers, has led Haiti with no interim president beside him. The U.S. and Mexico are planning a U.N. resolution to authorize an international security mission that would allow foreign forces into Haiti. If forces are allowed to enter, this will be at least the fourth time Haiti is subject to foreign intervention. The U.S. occupied Haiti between 1915 and 1934 and returned from 1994 to 2000. In 2004, the U.S. came back again, followed by U.N. peacekeepers after the ousting of Haiti's president at the time. The U.N. mission stayed in Haiti until 2017 and has since faced numerous sexual misconduct allegations. Peace this is crazy. Peacekeepers allegedly fathered and abandoned hundreds of children. Some mothers were as young as 11. Peace so... Some of these UN peacekeepers sexually assaulted young girls. Any wonder why the people of Haiti don't want these people coming back in? Any wonder why? As young as he left... These soldiers coming in, sexually assaulting girls as young as 11 years old, and then these little 11-year-old girls have to give birth to their kids. Any wonder why nobody wants the West to come in under military intervention? children. 
Some mothers were as young as 11. Peacekeepers also introduced cholera disease to the island, causing a crisis that killed around 10,000 people. So they didn't have cholera until the peacekeepers came. This is why they don't want them there. Introducing these gangsterization. Basically, it's a radicalization and then giving them the arms to be radicalized and then they end up causing issues around the country. And so because the United States and the West are the source of the problem, they also exacerbate it by giving the arms to them. This sounds so familiar. What, what does this sound like to you? It sounds like it's like giving itself a reason to come in and to restore order. Yeah, that's what the West does. That's what the United States does. I did a little bit of research and I was looking up some of the major natural resources that Haiti has too. Because the United States always does things for a, a reason for resources. So this is under Britannica. It says resources and power. It says gold and copper are found in small quantities in the north of the country. There's bauxite, aluminum ore deposits in the southern peninsula, but large scale mining was discontinued in 1983. Haiti apparently has no hydrocarbon resources on land or in the Gulf of Gonave and is therefore heavily dependent on energy imports, petroleum, petroleum products. Hydroelectricity provides roughly half of the power generated in the country and the remainder from thermal, uh, mainly coal-fired plants, especially in Port-au-Prince. However, the power supply is not sufficient to satisfy current needs, and the main sources of energy are cooking are firewood and charcoal. So it talks about it has a small domestic market in manufacturing and the lack of natural resources and internal instability have constrained the growth of manufacturing. In the late 20th century, many barriers to international trade were abolished and local industries were forced to compete directly with imports from the Dominican Republic and the United States. As most manufacturing is of processed foods, beverages, textiles, and footwears. Other manufacturers include chemical and rubber products, tobacco products, essential oils, notably Amaris, uh, Neroli, and Vetiver, and alco alcoholic beverages. Most of the country's sugar cane is processed in rural distilleries and produce a cheap rum called Clarin. Although Haiti also too could, produces Bamacourt rum, one of the world's finest brands. So, Basically, um, Haiti has some uh, natural resources. Um, and so, yeah. Um, but one of the things that I also wanted to show was a lot of times when people look at Haiti, they see this place that seems destitute. But I want to share this because Haiti is actually a very gorgeous country. But it just feels like a lot of times when people look at Haiti, well, I'll put it this way. It feels like this is an island paradise that people want to take over. And they really don't care about the people there. It's really about just taking this island nation instead. But it's like, we want to get rid of the people. 
So let me share this with you guys. I'm going to, because I don't know if this music is copywritten or not. So I'm going to, I'm just going to talk through it. But this is a sh uh, clip that says, this is Haiti, a paradise unknown. And so this actually shows you guys just the beauty of this island nation. Now, the thing is, is that when we talk about resources, people are also resources too, you know? And yes, Angelique says, my dad's country is so beautiful, love Haiti. Yeah, this is Haiti. This, look at this. Look at this island. Absolutely gorgeous. And yet, people are, you know, people see this as, you know, uh, a nation that is constantly in turmoil, primarily because it's overexploited. Remember what Michael Parenti said? He said, there's no such thing as a poor country. They're only overly exploited. This is the overly exploited country. But in reality, it is rich and beautiful. And the thing is, is it has a lot of rich history. But the United States constantly is meddling within it. And so look at how much land it has. And you think they don't want to occupy this land so that they can make more money? That's why. And this is why they want to take over. I wouldn't be surprised if the United States is trying to do to Haiti what they did to Hawaii. What they did to Puerto Rico. And Guam. In Samoa. It's pretty much all it is. So Haiti is a gorgeous nation. Really an island paradise. But it's being messed with so much by the United States and the West. That the people can hardly live. And yes, Angelique. Great point. Oh, hang on. The U.S. hates that it was a free black nation. And this also, <coughs> excuse me, this also pushes a narrative. And what is the narrative? That a black nation can never do well on its own. That a black nation cannot be successful. When in reality, it can. It's just that the West just needs to get out of it and leave it alone. That's honestly what it's about. It's this paternalistic narrative that a place like Haiti cannot do well without the leadership of white people. I'm sorry, but that's what it is. It cannot do well without the leadership of the West. It cannot do well without the leadership of capitalism, basically. And so that's ultimately what it is. Because here's the narrative that happens, uh, the conversation that happens to a lot of us Black people, especially here in the West. A lot of times we'll ask the question, well, why are these African countries, why can't they do well? Why is countries like Haiti and African countries like DRC and Somalia, Rwanda, Uganda, why, why can't they do so well? And then people will say, well, they just have corrupt governments. They're just a corrupt people. When in reality, it's the exploitation from the West that actually puts them in the position that they are. That's why. Because of imperialism, colonialism, 
That's why. But they don't ever want to tell you that. Because they don't want you to know that it's, technically it's their fault. That it's Belgium's fault. That it's France's fault. That it's Germany's fault. That it's Italy's fault. That it's Britain's fault. That it's the United States' fault. That's whose fault it really is. But they don't want to tell you that. Oh, yeah. That's why countries like Haiti are going through what they're going through. This is why when it comes to solidarity and with workers and the poor, this solidarity needs to be international. Solidarity with not just Haitian immigrants, but people who are still in Haiti. Solidarity with people who are in Vietnam, solidarity with people who are in Bolivia, solidarity with people who are in Libya, solidarity with people with the indigenous and poor people in Australia, solidarity with people like them because it needs an international movement. That's what it is. And that's what they're afraid of.